Thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me uh, back this year. I will try and convince you that uh, you don't need radiation therapy. Um, and by going over a lot of things, first off, this is the slide I'm going to put all my disclosures on because um, most of them are actually irrelevant. But I'd like to point out Nestle at the bottom. I actually have a conflict with Nestle. I'm so proud. Um, OK, so first off, what are the differences between chemo and radiation? Well, the truth is radiation takes a lot of thinking. And that, that just interferes with my day. Um, radiation requires a lot of math and physics to determine the treatment plan. Uh, the beam is carefully aimed. It's delivered in a few days to a few weeks. But chemo, um, while the side effects are sy systemic, the effects on the treatment is on the disease is systemic also. Uh, we don't have to think as much. We can use a simple calculator to figure out the dose. And we stick a needle in a patient's arm or in their chest, and we let the chemo flow wherever the blood takes it. And we don't have to aim anything. Um, <clears throat> The truth is that biology of pancreas cancer is unfavorable for radiation therapy. For localized resectable disease, study after study where patients have received surgery alone, 90% of patients recur because this is a systemic illness. If you remove a disease, the local disease doesn't kill you. Even what comes back localized, except in the R1 resection patients, is probably disease that was somewhere systemic and came back to the site of the original disease. So in dealing with a, a disease like this, you really need to deal with the systemic illness that is the metastatic disease that will eventually kill the patient. And dealing with the local disease is a nice thought and uh, a great, um, a very noble concept, but not necessarily going to have as much effect. I'm going to tell you a little bit about SMAD4 because I think this is one of the more interesting questions in that um, it's possible that SMAD4 may be a marker of uh, disease that's going to stay more local because we've all had patients with pancreas cancer who've died of disease without seeing a lot of systemic metastases. Um, and, and it's possible that SMAD4 may be able to detect patients who are going to stay a little bit more uh, localized versus those that uh, have uh, loss of SMAD4 who have more metastatic disease. But it's an imperfect marker. And in fact, actually, in the one study I could find where they looked at uh, SMAD4 loss, the truth is, uh, while it was intriguing, uh, chemo XRT did little in this study to prevent uh, local recurrence in the SMAD4 uh, intact patients. So I'm not sure even that will necessarily help us find a group of patients for whom radiation is beneficial. Now, having said that, there's a small study. I think we need to learn more about the SMAD4 question in localized versus metastatic disease. But nonetheless, I'm not sure it really helped to give radiation even to this group that supposedly stayed a little bit more localized. Well, we've got a lot of disease levels in pancreas cancer in the localized setting. We've got the locally advanced, we have the borderline resectable, and we have the completely resectable. Don't get me wrong, I've written a lot of the guidelines. I've helped to write a lot of the guidelines for borderline resectable. We're not really sure who's going to be resectable or who's going to become resectable and who's not. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure our guidelines truly rep, um, separate out those people who are really borderline resectable and will never, and will have a chance of going to surgery from the locally advanced who theoretically should never have a chance to go to surgery. But nonetheless, I want to look at radiation in the varied settings. And in this setting, this is LAP07, which is a trial in the locally advanced, supposedly never going to be able to go to surgery uh, setting. And what you see is that when you give chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation versus chemotherapy alone, you add nothing to the survival of the patients. And in the end, our goal is to keep these patients alive and well. And so if you're adding nothing, you're adding toxicity from the extra treatment. <clears throat> so I think, you know, the one thing about it was that the local recurrence was a little bit higher in the patients who didn't receive uh, radiation, but of course there was more metastatic disease in the patients um, who uh, received radiation. So, you know, the trade-off isn't necessarily a good one. And again, the survival was no better if you got radiation than if you didn't receive radiation. So in a locally advanced setting, I won't call it that we've figured out forever the role of radiation, but currently there's no radiation role <clears throat> with level one evidence. Um, we have had trials where we've looked at uh, stronger, better chemotherapies than in the old days with single agent gemcitabine. And we see these higher response rates, but this is metastatic disease. Okay, so while we're seeing 31, 32% response rate, which is high to a pancreas cancer oncologist, I realize compared to breast cancer, lymphoma, and a lot of diseases, that's not much of a response rate, but 
where we're seeing these higher response rates with these fulfirinox regimens, I'm going to be showing in a moment trials with chemotherapy alone or chemoradiation that actually a lot of them have less effective chemotherapy than the fulfirinox or the gemnap paclitaxel. You've all seen this data with a much better survival with fulfirinox compared to gemcitabine. Similarly, with gemnap paclitaxel, we've seen some pretty good effects. And again, the survival curves are separated. They separate beautifully. They stay separated. Um, and that's what we want to see in these uh, regimens. I'm also going to point out with this um, gem, uh, nabpaclitaxel data that although the response rates list is 23 percent, that's a centrally reviewed response rate. Fulfirinox was a investigator assessed. The investigator assessed response rate for gem plus nabpaclitaxel is 29 percent. Again, about a third of the patients responding to therapy is pretty good. And our goal is to try and shrink the disease because that's what kills the cells or that's what's killing cells and what's hopefully keeping the metastatic disease from coming back. Because in the long run, that's what we're getting to. I'm not going to go through that one, but the, I will say a couple of things. Um, I don't really know if gem nap paclitaxel one is better than the other. I also don't believe one is more toxic than the other. None of the statements that are made about gem nap paclitaxel versus fulfirinox have been proven yet. So I'm just going to leave it at that. So what about adjuvant therapy? Well, we've got multiple trials where in the adjuvant therapy post-operative, Radiation's added nothing. Um, it's actually, if you look at the survivals for the radiation arms, they tend to be 15, 17, 20 months. And when we look at the uh, chemo alone trials, we're getting 22, 24. These are, again, not randomized. But the only randomized trial we have is the SPAC-1, which a lot of people discredit because of the confusing way in which it was presented. But in truth, that was the way it was finally presented was the way it was originally designed. And chemo radiation in that setting, which was a bad radiation, was not effective and actually possibly harmful. So what about neoadjuvant? I don't expect you to read this slide. I know you're shocked because it really looks legible. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of studies from a, a, a review. Um, and what you look at is that the median survivals are not impressive. They always tend to run around 19 months with the exception of uh, uh, um, one trial. Uh, that they tend to run fairly low um, with chemo ra radiation uh, post -op, a pre op as a treatment. So I'm not impressed that these are so great because these are highly selected patients. These are patients who got the treatment beforehand and then got to surgery. <clears throat> In the most uh, recent trial was a, a systematic review of neoadjuvant therapy where they identified 103 neoadjuvant trials that had been published. Um, 39 met criteria for their review, so realized they threw out the vast majority of trials. Um, one study had radiation alone, nine studies had chemo, 29 studies had both chemotherapy and chemoradiation. Of those, about a third had monotherapy chemotherapy um, as the chemo, and um, of 19 had uh, combination chemo. None of them that were in this analysis were fulfirinox or gems, gemcitabine and napaclitaxel. So again, the uh, stage was a mishmash as well. Uh, some had resectable only. Some had borderline resectable only, and some had both. <clears throat> Overall, we don't get a lot of complete remissions with either chemotherapy or chemoradiation. And certainly with monotherapy, chemotherapy, it was about 1% complete remission rate, which is what we would expect. The PR rate was better, and the stable disease rate was interesting. It kind of made up if you had a higher PR, you had a lower stable disease rate. So the total for chemoradiation or chemo worked out to be fairly similar for disease control. The outcomes, interestingly, gemcitabine-based chemotherapy had a higher resection rate than other forms of chemotherapy, meaning fluoropyrimidine largely. Uh, chemotherapy and chemoradiation had similar response rates, which again, our response is what we're really looking for um, in trying to get, trying to presume that we're going to get more people to surgery, particularly for the borderline resectables. Um, but the R0 resection rate was higher for chemoradiation. However, in both these, in the analysis of response of one versus the other, or R0 resection, these studies were not randomized trials. They're not balanced for how many were borderline resectable versus resectable. So they just glommed all the patients together. However, I did think this was an interesting uh, review. Survival for chemo and chemo radiation were identical um, across all these trials, which was also very intriguing. Overall, 
in the systematic analysis, chemoradiation didn't really improve survival despite a slightly better R0 resection. Again, that could have been biased by the amount of patients with borderline resectable disease that were in one group versus the other, chemo or chemoradiation. There's no clear evidence that limited improvement in local control improves outcomes. So um, especially when you look at LAP07, where the, the local control almost seems to lead to more uh, systemic relapse, and of course, um, if it comes back, it doesn't matter, it's, it's still going to get them. And so if, if we don't improve survival, I'm not sure adding more therapy in the terms of radiation is really helpful. So just so you know, in the uh, most recent uh, data, when we looked at fulfirinox followed by chemoradiation in a, a localized setting, in a borderline resectable setting, we had um, four PRs and two uh, CRs with uh, the chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation, but most of those actually start, happened before we even started the chemoradiation. So overall, my conclusion, chemotherapy is at least as good as chemoradiation. Uh, newer regimens, Fulfirinox and Gemnab Paclitaxel, are just being studied now, and all this data that's out there are like 15 patient trials, and I did not opt to present them. Uh, in no setting of localized pancreas cancer is radiation proven benefit in terms of survival, and that's what we're aiming for, so although local control is cute, uh, what matters is survival. And radiation only has toxicity at this time to neoadjuvant therapies. So those are my conclusions.